I packed my suitcase, that's what we called them in that day, and appeared at the Nichols home and announced that I had come to study under Brother Nichols. <laughs> They received me as if I were a long-lost grandson. And it so happened that Hugo McCord was in a gospel meeting there at the Fifth Street Church, I believe it was called in that day. And for a week I heard him <coughs> speak. And then Brother Nichols left for the White House and carried me along with him. Well, I marveled at the ability and capacity of Hugo McCord, and I, I certainly delighted in making his acquaintance. But I'm to speak to the point of Hugo McCord, the writer. There are some several prerequisites to a man who gives his life in the area of writing. In the first place, he must have some information, scholarship. In the second place, he must have a capacity for good composition. He must have a certain directness, the ability to organize, and the simplicity of expression. In the third place, if he is to be the right kind of writer, he must have courage, courage to write, courage to speak, those things that need to be put in print and uh, spoken from the pulpit as well. And uh, in the next place, the writer must have purpose for writing. And his purpose should be high and lofty and not just to make a name for himself. Hugo McCord qualifies in all of these areas and in a very high statesmanlike way. He, I suppose, is not excelled by Anyone, there may be a number who come up to his level, there are no doubt, but he is not excelled by anyone in the area of scholarship in our brotherhood today. He has, in short, no superiors and not a whole raft of equals for that matter. He paid the price for a very enviable education. He attended Fried Hardeman College, the University of Illinois, the University of uh, Tulsa, the Virginia Seminary, the Southern Seminary, and the New Orleans Seminary. And he holds the BA, the MA, the BD, and the THD degree. This is not to say that a man must have these degrees in order to do a great work and to be a scholar for that matter. For Wallace said once that he had degrees at usually 98 and a few <laughs> points. <laughs> but Hugo McCord has excelled in writing. And there are numerous proofs of his scholarship. The living message of the Psalms that appears in one of the lecture books is a gem. So much information is put in so small a space. And then there is the Gospel of Luke which when I first saw his lecture, now in book form, I, I stood somewhat amazed at the information that he brought forth in that lecture. Uh, the Gospel of Luke, 
It was an exceptionally fine lecture. And then another lecture that should be in every preacher's library, along with all of these, is his lecture on the Godhead. A tremendously well-prepared lesson. He is the author of a book entitled The Messianic Prophecy. And it is a very excellent book. I've had the occasion to not only read it, but to refer to it on uh, various occasions. And then there is his book on the credibility of creation, an excellent book, and uh, the royal route of revelation, a uh, rule perhaps it is, uh, another excellent book. And in this book, and this is characteristic of all of his writings. He is very careful to be conservative, and uh, at any place where he is not sure, he is humble enough to state uh, the caution that beyond a certain point in this area, he is wont to say, we must not go. He has a very excellent book entitled The Christian Family and another Bible Lands and Sacred History. His writings are not only characterized by scholarship, but they are characterized by utmost simplicity. There is in them that directness that we like to read when following a writer. His writings would qualify for a place in any theological library. Now, I have some suggestions for the man. Uh, a number of these lectures that are scattered here and there should be pulled out and put in book form. Amen. And he ought to be, along with his other duties, writing a commentary on the Psalms. He is so abundantly qualified to do this, and he I've heard him lecture on the Psalms for, oh, 20-some-odd hours, uh, not all at one time. <laughs> <laughs> he is not like Wendell Winkler and some of these who have to say it all at, at one season. <laughs> but I promise you, if you ever have an opportunity to hear Hugo McCord lecture on the Psalms, do not pass it up. He is a great writer. And he deserves this honor on this occasion, along with his good wife. Without her, he could not have done so well, uh, by her own admission. <laughs> Another longtime friend, deeply loved, and that love, of course, is receptacle from both sides. Our brother and sister McCord is Brother Earl West from Indianapolis, Indiana. Brother West is to appear later on our lecture program, and we'll further introduce him at that time. But at this juncture in our dinner honoring the McCords, it's now our pleasure to present to you Brother Earl West, who will be discussing Hugo McCord, the student and the preacher. Brother Winkler, I'll tell you right now, after listening to these two speeches about Brother McCord, I don't know whether we're talking about the same person or not. <laughs> Yesterday at 1 o'clock, there was a new governor inaugurating Indiana. 
And the old governor, Governor Bowen, has served two terms, one of the most popular governors I think we've ever had in the state. <laughs> Newspaper reporter went up to him and said, well, uh, what do you think about all these nice things that are being said about you when you retire as governor? He said, well, may the Lord forgive them for all their exaggerations and may forgive me for enjoying it so much. <laughs> But on the other hand, not anybody really that knows Brother McCord and his good wife really thinks that any amount of, of um, great, thoughtful considerations or words about him, and no way that anybody could ever exaggerate on him at all. It'd just be impossible in a few short speeches, such as we're doing here, to be able to say enough about a man like Brother McCord, because I know of nobody that is really as worthy of all the love and the kindness and consideration that other people are able to give to him. And largely people respond that way to Brother McCard because that's the way he is. And I suppose in one sense of the term, we give back to him uh, the same kind of thoughtfulness that, in a measure at least, that he's always been so willing to give to us. I've heard it said so many times since I first came into the church back in my teenage years. Brother so-and-so is a great preacher, and when I got involved in the restoration movement, and I feel like I have lived a lot with old preachers and the lives they lived, the things they thought. So many, many times I've heard people say or read where people have said that so-and-so was a great preacher. Yet I've always wondered, well, what is it that makes a great preacher? And I found out that what one person thinks is a great preacher is not necessarily uh, what somebody else is going to think about it at all. To many people, a great preacher is simply that one that has that unique ability to get lots of people to respond to the gospel of Christ. Well, I think we admire that in anybody. We always look up with a certain amount of, of grandeur to the person that has that sort of a unique ability. Yet, on the other hand, we've had lots of great preachers in our brotherhood's history that didn't have that sort of ability at all. J.W. McGarvey, for example. McGarvey would say that, a, that any kind of a, of a spirit that he would really desire would be the sort of an attitude where he can look out over an audience and here sits a man or a woman over here, and he said, I know they know the gospel as well as I do, but if I just had the power to move them, he said, I'd be very grateful to possess it. Yet Brother McGarvey was a very great preacher, though he did not have that kind of power. By the same token, Alexander Campbell was a great preacher. But Campbell did not have the power to move people out of their seats and to get them to respond to the invitation. Well, it takes, of course, a different sort of an estimate, I imagine. Well, on the other hand, sometimes we think a great preacher is a man who's a great orator. Well, from that standpoint, we've had a lot of them in the church. Uh, men like Noel Shaw in the early days. Not as beautiful, although he could reach beautiful heights, but not that way consistently. But on the other hand, baptized so many people because of that unique power. Many of you remember T.B. Larimore, who also was a very beautiful speaker and could appeal to so many people through that power. Yet, of course, there have been great preachers in our brotherhood, they were not necessarily beautiful speakers. The rhetoric was not necessarily enviable to us at all. Well, I suppose it narrows down to say this, that what constitutes a great preacher is really a, an individual's own private estimate. And I want to suggest just very briefly my own private estimate of what I think is a great preacher. And by my estimate, I think really that Brother Hugo McCord is one of the great preachers of our day and time. For one thing, I think a great preacher is a man uh, who lives, of course, the Christian life in the very finest of style. I know we all realize we could go to a penitentiary and get an ardent criminal. Uh, we could help him memorize a few passages teaching the plan of salvation. He could get out and he could do the job, standing up before an audience and tell them all they need to do to be saved. But yet he wouldn't be a great preacher at all, and his words would be hollow. Whether we like it or not, what we say pretty largely comes by way of what we are. And there's no way that we ever divorce 
a man's message away from what kind of a man is uttering that message. But I think the power in Brother McCord as a speaker comes across to all of us because here is a man who genuinely, sincerely, deeply loves the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves all of his fellow man. He loves to do for them what is possible for him to do that is good. About a year ago, when my wife was so very critically ill, the phone rang one Saturday, and Brother McCord says, Earl, I want to come to Indianapolis, and I want to preach for you tomorrow. I don't know very many people that would have ever thought about that. But it takes somebody with the kindness and thoughtfulness and love of a Hugo McCord to always be able to sense that right here is a present need, and I'll just be able to fill it in. For purity of life, purity of heart, and for a genuine, deep, sincere love and kindness, I've never met anybody in all sincerity that I think can exactly duplicate Brother McCord along this line. Well, by my estimate also, I think that a um, great preacher is somebody, certainly, that is knowledgeable in the Scripture. We can hardly tell people things we don't know any more than we can write about it, as Brother Turner has suggested. But, of course, people, as you well know, don't learn the Bible overnight. It isn't a matter of reading somebody's sermon outline and then come away with the feeling that I know all this, and I can get up and preach a beautiful sermon. Well, you may be able to do it to an extent. But yet knowing the Bible is a lifetime proposition. It's living with it every day. It's not only just memorizing the words, which Brother McCord has done, of course, in a very enviable style. But it's to read the Bible with a feeling of knowledge of what the writer's writing about. One can come in contact with the spirit of David and David's great love for God by just living with David every day. And Brother McCord has done that. His knowledge of the Scripture is tremendous, as has already been pointed out to you here. And as a result, I think that makes him a great preacher. But then, too, I think also in, in a final way, a great preacher is somebody that is true to what he knows about the Scripture. There are so many people that because of pressures of a social nature or a political pressure or some other kind can simply shave off their particular sermon that will satisfy somebody. But really the thing that ought to be true of every one of us is we not only understand what God's Word says, but each one, in the kindness of his own heart and yet with the firmness of his character, that he stand true to whatever it is that God Almighty has said. For the Elam was president, as many of you know, of the old Nashville Bible School for a number of years. He lived at a time when oratory was very much sought after, particularly in the South. He was a great orator and a great speaker and a great preacher. But well, oftentimes when people would talk to Brother Elam about his uh, life's ambition and what he really hoped to accomplish, he said, above everything else, when I come time to die, he said, I want it to be inscribed on my tombstone that here lies one who shunned not to declare the whole counsel of God. And he said, if that can be said about me, that's the greatest honor that I ever want. Well, I think it's rather marvelous that he had that. And to me, he's a very great preacher because that was his disposition. To be a godly Christian man, to have an understanding of the Word of God, and then to be true to it, that to me constitutes a great preacher. And I think Brother McCord is one of the greatest of our day simply because he fills all of those particular qualifications. Appreciate those words so very much. Brother Terry Johnson, who is president of Oklahoma Christian College, wants to be here for the dinner today. I haven't heard from Terry, and I said, well, here, Terry, I'm looking everywhere for you. How long have you been over there? 
I'm so glad to see. I was fixing to state what happened. I, I was having Terry to come at 5 o'clock this evening when we said that. It's so good to have Terry here. Terry is going to be speaking to us uh, briefly, as these other men have so done. And his emphasis will be Hugo McCord as the teacher and the trainer. And it's rather unique in that uh, Terry was both a student of Brother McCord's and then, of course, being president of Oklahoma Christian College, had such a very wonderful relationship with him with Brother McCord serving there on the faculty. But I thought what had happened, since I couldn't find Terry, is when we said the honor to whom honor is due dinner, that he took that to be 5 o'clock and wasn't here. So I'm so glad that you're here, and it's good to see you. Thank you, Brother Winkler. I wouldn't have missed this for uh, for anything. There were others on our campus who wanted to come and be part of this occasion. Uh, James Baird, our, pres our chancellor, wanted to be here. Uh, Stafford North, our executive vice president, wanted to come. Raymond Kelsey, our chairman of our Bible faculty, wanted to be here. I was the only one whose uh, schedule was light enough to permit him to get away and uh, <laughs> be able to... Uh, join in this occasion. I wouldn't have let Raymond Kelsey come for anything, though. Uh, he and Hugo McCord had gotten into a debate right off the start. <laughs> Probably been some weighty matter, like which one of the two of them was the best looking. <laughs> their looks are rivaled only by their modesty and their humility. <laughs> But in terms of speaking of Hugo McCord as, um, as a teacher and a trainer of young people, why I can speak from a perspective there that those men cannot. There are some in this audience who can speak from the same perspective. But uh, I had 11 hours of Bible under Hugo McCord, a freshman uh, survey. Um, I took freshman survey during my sophomore year. I don't know what that says about me, but uh, Old Testament survey, New Testament survey, Book of Acts, and Christian evidences. And if I live to be 100, I'll, I'll never hear anyone say, take out a half a sheet of paper without thinking of Hugo McCord. <laughs> Especially if it sounds something like this. Why don't you take out a half a sheet of paper? Question number one to five. Question number one. Who is the best teacher? On the campus of Oklahoma Christian College. A... Raymond Kelsey, <laughs> B, Howard Norton, or C, the one who'll be grading your exam. <laughs> Brother Hugo McCoy. Now, some of you might put Raymond Kelsey. He's a good man. He has a good heart. But he's wrong. <laughs> there are others who actually give a much better impression of uh, Hugo than I do. But there, there are a few students who have had him for that many hours who can't do something with his voice. <laughs> In fact, this is true. Stafford North teaches homiletics. And he'd have to spend about a half a trimester working out of the students their Hugo McCord imitation when they'd give their speeches. <laughs> that's, tr that's true. Uh, you know, you pick up some of that and... Uh, they were really trying to ape the man in uh, a way that probably was not to their uh, best advantage. So uh, we had to do some work on that from time to time. Back in 1954, James Baird became the second president of, at that time it was known as Central Christian College. He succeeded uh, L.R. Wilson, who had been president the first four years. 
Uh, Dr. Baird officially took over as president in September of 54, but he began his work prior to that in terms of filling the, the role and uh, beginning to bring about uh, his team. And he selected uh, Hugo McCord to be his vice president and the one to uh, lead the Bible program at uh, Central Christian College there in Bartlesville. I doubt if James Baird ever made a personnel decision that was more important or more crucial for the well-being of Oklahoma Christian College than when he hired uh, Hugo McCord to come and be a part of our program. It was Hugo's request that he always be permitted to teach the freshman classes. That's where he wanted his influence and his impact to be felt. Uh, he enjoyed taking those youngsters uh, coming away from home for the first time, uh, that freshman Bible course, and uh, letting his uh, influence be felt in their lives. And for some 25 years, we enjoyed very much uh, his teaching those freshman classes. This is just the first year, as a matter of fact. He and Lois engaged in some travels and some trips. The first year that we've been without his services teaching those freshman Bible classes. We learned from his scholarship, as has been noted, a man who, who knows the book. He's a student of the Word. I think he and uh, Brother Gus, uh, Hardiman's dad, are, are the two that I think of uh, first in my mind when I think of men who that I've known personally and been close to who really were students uh, of the Word. Uh, if you haven't heard his all-scripture sermon or one of several that he has, why, it's, it's a great thrill just to, to worship uh, on a service in which he's preaching one of those all-scripture uh, lessons. But as Brother West indicated, we learn so much from his example. I think, I think some of the magic of the teaching of Jesus was that he, he modeled so much of what he taught. Uh, he would t teach, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, and then with the towel he would model that humility, that spirit of humility. And he would teach uh, about materialism to the rich young ruler, but then uh, he would withstand the temptations of materialism in the wilderness. Uh, or he would uh, uh, teach uh, these lessons with regard to forgiveness, Peter, uh, 40, uh, seven times seven, and then he would model forgiveness on the cross. And in so much the same way, that's what we learned under Hugo McCord. He modeled the Christian attitude uh, that we needed so badly in our classrooms. Uh, he's a man of strong uh, convictions and strong positions, and we know him to take those strong positions. But he could disagree without being disagreeable. And that's a quality that we have come to admire and respect so much. Uh, Hugo and Raymond, uh, Kelsey, uh, on the open forum at the Oklahoma Christian College Lectureship, it's a great thrill just to see those men delve into the scriptures. And there were times in our times uh, when they take positions that are contrary to one another as it pertains to a point in God's word. And yet the two men have that great reservoir of goodwill for one another that they, uh, they were trem are tremendous friends. And by the way, that uh, uh, open forum will be taking place uh, January 26, 27, and 28 uh, this month up at the campus of Oklahoma Christian College and hope you can come. The man had a sense of humor that, that carries him a long way in terms of his relationship uh, with students. Uh, you would see uh, Hugo McCord dressed out in his western hat and his six shooters and his cowboy boots on western day every year at Oklahoma Christian College, and the kids love it. Uh, they uh, learn to, to understand that this was a complete man, a full man. Uh, he was a man who taught them about the, the, the deep, issues of God's word, but he had the time to be uh, one who would uh, cut up and be one of them. And as has also been noted, uh, we gain so much as students of his by virtue of knowing Loa. She's a great uh, credit to him. She's a great credit to the brotherhood. Uh, she's one who uh, not only supported him, but she radiated that spirit of goodwill. And uh, we all uh, have basked in the glow of her enthusiastic, uh, warm spirit. She led our Oklahoma Christian College Women Association group for a number of years and continues to be active in those kinds of programs. I would close with a story. Uh, some years ago, about two or three, I guess it's been now, my wife and I went to Williamsburg, Virginia uh, to see that colonial restoration and some of the uh, history that surrounds that area of Virginia. One night uh, late, we were walking across the colonial lanes and 
it was springtime and uh, the flowers smelled so good, the blossoms, and we walked onto the campus of William and Mary, the second oldest college uh, in this country. And we went up to the Christopher Wren building, which is now being used for uh, an administration hall, and up the steps and onto the porch, these large columns, that building, and there on the, the, the <laughs> wall of that Christopher Wren building is a placard that says the distinguished alumni of William and Mary, and it reads like a page out of American history books. It has all of those great Virginia gentlemen, the Lees and the Randolphs and the Adam, or the uh, uh, Washingtons and the Jeffersons and uh, these that have become known as being part of, of that uh, great community. And I thought to myself then, you know, Oklahoma Christian College may never produce a president of the United States. And we may never produce someone who's the United States senator or a governor of a state or a Supreme Court justice. But I thought, well, that's not that's not our mission, that's not our purpose. Uh, we're here to be of service to the Lord's Church and to produce leadership for the Lord's Church. And if we can turn out another generation of, of Batsel Barrett Baxters and another generation of Ira Norths and another generation of Marshall Keebles and Helen Youngs and another a generation of Willard Collinses, and Hardeman Nichols and Gus Nichols. And if we can turn out another generation of Hugo and Lois McCords, our Christian colleges will be well served. They're a product of a Christian college, and I'm sure that there are young men and women today who are coming through the halls of these Christian institutions who have been influenced by people like Lois and Hugo McCord, who will be great leaders and great champions for truth, for the church, and the generation ahead. Hugo McCord, the Christian. Hugo McCord, the writer. Hugo McCord, the student and preacher. And Hugo McCord, the teacher and the trainer of men. Four men whose lives have certainly been influenced by and have been very close to the one whom we're honoring today. We thank Brother West and Brother Turner, Brother Wise and Brother Johnson for their contribution to this program. At this time, I'd like to ask Brother and Sister McCord to come and stand right in this given position here on the platform, if you will, please. I'd like to read in your hearing the wording of the plaque that will be presented at this time. In profound respect, deep appreciation, and abiding love to Carl Hugo McCord, a dedicated Christian, a beloved teacher, a trainer of preachers, prolific writer, loyal brother, and gospel preacher of unique distinction. Presented by a grateful brotherhood at the annual Honor to Whom Honor Dinner of the Fort Worth Lectures, January 13, 1981. You heard Guy would say after some marvelous compliments, compliments are like perfume. They are made to be smelled and not swallowed. <laughs> <laughs> among, among these very flattering statements, that which I appreciate most of all is about my spouse. She doesn't like that word. <laughs> but it was in 1934 when Boone Douthat, some of you know that great name, stayed in our home in Indianapolis, Earl, for a gospel meeting. 
when he left, he said, you go, you shoot it out, marry yourself. <laughs> I've never felt uh, downhearted because of that slap in the face. <laughs> who is Apollos and who is Paul except ministers by whom you believe? even the Lord gave to every man. None of us personally is really important from that standpoint. And that statement in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17, so misused, I think has appropriateness in this connection. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. The emphasis, I believe, is this. Christ did not send me, Paul, to do the dipping so that you could have a certificate signed by Paul. The person doesn't make any difference. Just ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. I thank you so much. You pray for us to be able to have many more years of trying to serve. Earl is so young that actually Lois used to teach him in a Bible class. <laughs> Those are the years that have come and gone. And so I won't take your time. We need to get in there and we're all here. <laughs> Every year when we have these honor to whom honor is due dinners, I'm always so encouraged and so uh, admonished by some of the observations that are made, and that's certainly taken place today by the observations of these four men who have been here with us and listened to that gracious response by Brother McCord. And we do love and appreciate Car uh, Brother McCord and Lois. And they have been here every single year on the lectures, and as long as Fort Worth lectures exist, I'm sure that will continue thus to be. Well, 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 yes, sir. Let me tell one of them what here to remind me of. Please. All right, yes, want you to. Come right up here and do that. Do that. I'm a fanatic about that word doctor, as Terry knows. And the first lecture that I've given all those years, the freshman in September, is don't call me doctor. <laughs> now, there's a spiritual principle back of it I won't go into. Academically, it's all right. Nothing wrong with it for the North Central Academic Association. And there's a tale also about being vice president I'd like to get into, but I won't go into that. <laughs> Our James came over one day and gave me the pink slip. But that's enough. This tale reminds me of this. When we got back from England one September, he heard I had received a title while I was in England. And this was the sequence of events. 76 it was, 1976, we had a car wreck totaled out out from Ripley, Mississippi, and had to get a car within an hour to go on to a gospel meeting. Got a demonstrator. The first time I'd ever had what's called a Mercury Braun. I didn't know what that meant, B-O-G-H-M. But I just looked at it, went on up to Atwood, Tennessee, and our host up there had a Cadillac, and it was called a Cadillac Braun. Well, I said, well, wait a minute here, Bill. I said, General Motors and Ford, why, they both call their car by the same thing. Well, he said, that means it's the first in their line. Whatever it is, Braun is number one. Well, I said, why didn't my mama call me that name? <laughs> and my younger brother said, well, that's because she knew he was coming. <laughs> Well, then some good friends took us over to England in a missionary project, and I was telling the hostess on this trip about that. And she says, you deserve a title while you're in England, of course. She said, I'm going to 
anoint you Baron Braun. Baron Braun. <laughs> so that got back to theory by the time school started that Hugo isn't against titles anymore. 